Final rule. It's called pet a cat when you encounter one on the street, and it's it's a very it's the most personal chapter in the book. It's a lot about my daughter, and my daughter was very ill when she was well when she was a kid, but well, particularly when she was a teenager, she had a very terrible time of it. Um, she had juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, and when she was between the ages of 14 and 16, it first destroyed her hip, which had to be replaced, and then it destroyed the ankle on her other leg, which had to be replaced and she walked around for two years on broken legs and she was taking massive doses of opiates and could hardly stay awake and like and she had this advanced autoimmune disease which produced all sorts of other symptoms that were just as bad as the joint degeneration but which are harder to describe and so it's just bloody brutal you know and as a test of your faith there's almost nothing that's more direct than a serious illness inflicted upon an innocent child right and so the chapter is a meditation on that and also on well, what to do in a situation like that because everyone is going to have a situation like that in some sense, you know, because you'll be faced with illness in the people that you love and in crisis. And so it's a, it's a practical guide to coping with those sorts of things. Like in one of the things you do when you're overwhelmed by crisis is you shorten your time frame. You know, it's like you can't think about next month. Maybe you can't even bloody well think about next week or maybe not even tomorrow. You know, because now is just so overwhelming that that's all there is. It's like, and that's what you do. You cut your time frame back until you can cope with it. And if it's not the next week that you see how to get through, then it's the next day. And if it's not the next day, then it's the next hour. And if it's not the next hour, then it's the next minute. And you know, people are very, 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 very tough. It turns out that if you face things that you can put up with a lot more than you think you can put up with and you can do it without becoming corrupted. And she did recover quite, quite fully and much as a consequence of her own machinations because she figured out what was wrong with her and then took the necessary steps to fix it, which is nothing short of a bloody miracle as far as I'm concerned. And uh, anyways, part of the, the, the cat bit is I actually start by talking about our dog who actually died about a year ago but he's still alive in the book um, you know if you want to pet a dog on the street that's okay too so you don't have to get up in arms about it but but the idea is that you know you have to be alert when you're suffering you have to be alert to the beauty in life the unexpected beauty in life and that's kind of what I was trying to get across with the idea of the cat. There's this cat that lives across the street from us called Ginger, and Ginger's a Siamese cat. And cats really aren't domesticated, eh? technically speaking. They're still wild animals, but they kind of like people. God only knows why, but they do, you know. And so Ginger will come wandering over, and our dog looks at her, but they're friends, and she rolls over on his back, and Seiko used to, you know, nose her a bit. And, and then she'd kind of mosey over and let you pet her if she was feeling like it that day. And, you know, you have to look for those little bit of that little bit of sparkling crystal in the darkness when things are bad you have to look and see where things are still beautiful and where there's still something that's sustaining and you know you narrow your time frame and you be grateful for what you have and that can get you through some very dark times why did i write these rules well you know 
And especially when I said, well, you should try to improve yourself instead of trying to set the world straight, or in, instead of worrying about what other people are doing wrong. You might say, well, that's a hell of a thing for someone to say who just wrote a book called 12 Rules for Life. It's like, you know, but the thing is, is that I wasn't just writing that. I was writing that for me as much as for anyone else. And I, I mean that, I really mean that sincerely. You know, I had an opportunity to spend somewhere around five years meditating on how you should conduct yourself so that your life is what it could be and like I'm in the group of people that I'm advising you, you know what I mean it's like all of these things are very difficult to stand up straight to remember that and to treat yourself like you're someone worthwhile and to make friends with people who are good for you and 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 to tell the truth or at least not to lie I mean these are all ideals right and especially taken as a whole they constitute a kind of ideal and you never you never you never attain the ideal the, and not only that, it recedes as you approach it, right? Because you, you straighten yourself out and you think, well, I've got it now. And you think, no, wait a minute, there's more to go. There's still more to go. And then you get that much farther along the line. You think, oh, yeah, I thought this was the end of the road. It's like, no, there's plenty of imperfections left to iron out. And so it is a constant adjustment. And, but there's something about that that's also positive. Because you might say that it's not so much that there isn't such a thing as a good person. It's that our idea of what constitutes good isn't right. Because a good person is someone who's trying to get better. And, and no matter how good you are, there's better that you can get. But the, the real goodness is in the attempt, right? It's in the, it's in the process, to, to use somewhat of a cliche. You know, there's this, and I'll close with this, and it's a good way, way to close. You know, and this is a psychological observation. The, the central figure of Western culture is Christ. And we can look at that psychologically, because Christ is the dying and resurrecting hero. And what does that mean psychologically? Well, it means that <clears throat> you learn things painfully. And when you learn something painfully, a part of you has to die. That's the pain. You know, when a dream is shattered, for example, a huge part of you that, that constituted that dream, maybe even the biological substrate of that dream has to be stripped away and, and burned. And so, life is a constant process of death and rebirth. And to participate in that fully is to allow yourself to be redeemed by it. And so the good is that process of death and rebirth, voluntarily undertaken. It's like you're not as good as you could be, so you let that part of you die. And if someone comes along and says, you know, there's some dead wood here. Man, it needs to be burned off. You think, well, that stuff's still a bit alive. When that burns, it's going to hurt. It's like, yeah, well, no kidding. But maybe the thing that emerges in its place is something better. And I think this is the secret of human beings. This is what we're like, you know. Unlike any other creature is that we can let our old selves die and let our new selves be born. And that's what we should do. And so... Where do I fall short in these 12 rules? Well, endlessly, because, well, here's a way of thinking about it. Until the entire world is redeemed, we all fall short. And you can do that, you know, in the worst situation, you can make it only tragic and not hell. And there's a big gap between tragedy and hell, you know. There's nothing worse at a deathbed than to see the people there fighting. The death is bad enough, but you can take that, as terrible as it is, and make it into something that's absolutely unbearable. And maybe I think, and this is sort of what I closed the book with, is this idea is that if we didn't all attempt to make terrible things even worse than they are, then maybe we could tolerate the terrible things that we have to put up with in order to exist. And maybe we could make the world into a better place, you know? And it's what we should be doing and what we could be doing because we don't have anything better to do. And that's what the book is about. And that's the end of 12 Rules for Life. Thank you.